Right, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's a really interesting session. Um, uh, in this presentation, I want to uh, look at graffiti at a nature reserve at the Devil's Spittlefall, just southwest of Birmingham. Uh, this is kind of an experimental work for me. It's a bit of a work in progress. But I'm interested in how we theorize natural places, uh, and in particular, wild places. I'm also interested in the way in which uh, what we call wild spaces are used for graffiti, but also for other activities, both official and official, uh, in the way human beings interact with them to create monuments. Uh, in their 2010 volume, Wild Signs, uh, Neil and Oliver make implicit the idea that graffiti is associated both with wild or subversive behaviour, and in some way uh, also with places that are wild or contested. This is just an outline of my presentation. Uh, I'm an environmental archaeologist, so I can't help. I'm going to give you some ecology. I just can't <laughs> stop myself. <laughs> oh, <I think. laughs> uh, but why would an environmental archaeologist be interested in graffiti? Well, it's a personal story, but um, <clears throat> around about three years ago, I had a very long illness, or I recovered from a very long illness. Uh, and for part of my convalescence, the doctors recommended that I join a society uh, and do some volunteering. So for about a year, I spent a day a week working for a wildlife trust. Uh, and if you volunteer for a wildlife trust, what you do is you go and cut down what's called scrub. Scrub is the enemy of nature, <laughs> as we'll see. Um, uh, and so uh, during this time, I was struck by how much graffiti there are, there is in nature reserves, uh, and how much illicit activities, as far as the wildlife trusts were concerned, was being undertaken in wild places. And also thinking back to my youth, uh, the way in which we used to go out uh, en masse and take over places for particular activities uh, when I was younger. And it reminded me of that. Uh, so the, na the nature reserve at Devil's Spitalfall, which we'll come on to, this is one of the fields in the nature reserves, um, uh, is advertised as one of Worcestershire's wildest places. And I wish to discuss how mutable such designations are and how the nature of a place can encourage graffiti, uh, not just in the present, but also, as I hope to show, uh, for a long period of time. I also wish to show how places can go from being uh, a farmscape to a wildscape, which is also what's happened. Uh, a little bit about methodology. Fairly standard archaeological things that you do. Um, I, I did take a slightly unusual approach, uh, which I'll come on to, uh, and we're hoping to go back uh, and do some laser scanning. The department's just acquired a laser scanner, so we're hoping to go back and do some laser scanning as well. There's also a, a much wider, extensive historic landscape, which I'm not going to talk about. What I do want to talk about is Henry David Thoreau uh, for a bit, sorry, uh, because I wasn't sure if people would know his work. Uh, Henry David Thoreau is the guy uh, on the far side of the picture. So in thinking about nature and nature reserves, I wanted to use the ideas of Thoreau. The, the nature reserve I am studying is often described as a wild place. It also, thanks to its name and foundation pit myth, appears to have a reputation as a place of mischief and revelry. In thinking about what the wild uh, might be, though I was confronted by a problem. Archaeologists don't really talk about the wild very much. We talk about farmscapes and fieldscapes. And we don't really give a lot of thought to the trackless waste that lie outside the head dikes and garths of our settlements. So what in the, this context does wild mean now? And uh, maybe we can start to think about what that might have meant in the past. So. The wild has often been identified with horror and terror. The OED defines wilderness as a wild or uncultivated tract of land, uninhabited by humans or only by wild animals. This started to change a little bit uh, with the development of the picturesque in the middle of the 18th century in England. And the influence of the romantic poets, especially Coleridge, who followed Kant and his ideas of the sublime, uh, was taken up by Wordsworth and probably don't have time for it, but there's a great quote from the prelude about the idea of the wild as a, as a thing, but uh, I might try and stick that in later. Uh, but Wordsworth and later Ruskin helped to change this idea of the wild. 
the wild began to be seen as an inspirational environment, suitable for leisure, and likely to bring improvements both to physical and spiritual health. So the wild was promoted as a place you could go to and learn about yourself and become a better human being. But it's also worth remembering that people like Wordsworth still held a distinction between the cultivated nature of the farm and the field and that of the wild, usually situated in a remote region which held a kind of terror and majesty uh, for the people who went there. Although we are still in the process of discovering the historicity of wild places, such as forests and an enclosed ground, there is growing evidence that there were places in which people could experiment, as it was not technically owned or subject to surveillance. The wild was a new space which people could enter to and negotiate with to create an environment for their own actions. So it's a place you can go and do more or less what you want. This might be anything from a picnic to graffiti, uh, temporary cramps and squatting, or in the modern era, free festivals, raves, or extreme sports. Uh, so with this in mind, I would just like to review uh, the thought of one of the main philosophers of the wild and wilderness, uh, Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau was an American poet and philosopher. On July 4th, 1845, he went to Walden Pond near Concord in Massachusetts to experiment in what he called simple living. He had been given the land to squat on by his mentor, the poet and transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson. He published his account of his experiences there as Walden in 1854. He died eight years later at the age of 44. Together with his other writings, Thoreau prefigured and has come to dominate much of the thinking in ecology and ecological and environmental philosophy. In particular, he developed the idea of the importance of wildness and wilderness for human survival and health, the idea that areas should be set aside for nature, and that nature is and was an inalienable other, incapable of true understanding. He then went on to examine what that might mean for people who want to live in such a world. Thoreau was keen to make the point that the otherness of the wild did not just reside in mountains and the spectacular, but instead was all around us, unnoticed and unheeded, but always there, always waiting. His genius was to find the wild a couple of miles out of town, just across the railroad tracks. And Walden is just literally about four miles outside of Concord. Uh, and this is something that Jorgensen and Talco in their recent paper on interstitial wild spaces in modern urban settings have also discussed. Reading and looking to Walden for guidance in this project, I found that Thoreau prefigures much of contemporary archaeology. He argues that we should inhabit the landscape, spend time in it, try and study it not as an alienated observer, but by being fully engaged with it. He asks us to ignore the pyramids and what he calls the boobies who built them, but to pay attention to the people who are not doing great things, but are living a simpler life. He himself made a study of the Penobscot and Massachusetts peoples who had lived near Concord. So in this study, I have attempted as much as possible to spend time in the landscape, to give as much thought to the ecological as to the human dimensions, and in particular to think about how much of a wild place the Spitalful really is. A final word on Thoreau and graffiti. Uh, he didn't like graffiti, and he thought the jack and apes who made it, as he called them, uh, who carved their names into the trees and mountains of his home were just idiots, really. But <laughs> as these things often are, he himself has become a familiar figure in graffiti across the United States, and you'll quite often see his quotes uh, posted around, which is something interesting. Can I just have some water? So the Devil's Spitalful is <clears throat> located right where am I? The Devil's Spitalful is located in the West Midlands uh, of uh, I've got a page out of place, sorry, one second. Uh, it's located in the West Midlands of England. Now, the West Midlands is the fourth most populated part of the UK and is in the top 30 most densely populated parts of the world. So it's not a place you'd expect to find a lot of wildness. Uh, so in this section, I'm just going to review the documentary evidence for the environmental changes that led to the Spitalful becoming what's known as a wild place. The, Devil, the Doomsday Book first mentions a Toilsburg, which is, <clears throat> according to the place name people, 
Devil's Mountain, uh, and so possibly Devil uh, and the Spadeful is a corruption of this. Um, we have uh, very little evidence prior to about 1815. Walkover surveys have produced some Roman and medieval pottery, but there's no settlement evidence. The main use of the landscape over the last 200 years has either been for leisure um, or military purposes, although the rifle range probably really was leisure <coughs> in the sense that it was just a bunch of soldiers running around in tanks with machine guns, uh, which is what they find fun. The earliest documentary evidence we have for the environment at the Spitalfall is this uh, Henry Stevens map of 1815. Uh, as you can see, the name Devil Spitalfall is already there. Uh, it's the isolated mound in the, more or less, just on the left of the picture. There's a large area, there's not a pointer, is there? There's a large area of grey, uh, and that's a depression which is later became the nature reserve. In the mid-19th century, George Griffiths, who was a local poet uh, and self-proclaimed scholar, described the Spitalfall as a being in the center of an extensive amphitheater, a large mound of earth composed of rock, covered with furs, and completely perforated on all sides by rabbits. He also wrote down uh, the foundation myth for what's called the Spadeful. In the myth, <clears throat> a drunken cobbler spends the night drinking with a very tired Satan who is on his way to destroy the local town of Budley. The inhabitants of Budley were renowned for their godliness and this had annoyed Satan, so he'd got a shovel full of soil, of uh, volcanic rock from Etna, and he was on his way to destroy uh, Budley. However, he fell to drinking with his cobbler, and seeing the cobbler's sack of shoes, Satan inquires why the cobbler has, him, has them. The cobbler, being quick thinking, persuades the Satan that he needs them for his journey, uh, because it's so far to uh, Budley. Satan, being a lazy soul, uh, just dropped his load of rocks, uh, and disappears off down into hell. And so that's the creation myth for the monument itself, well, not the monument, for the mound itself. Uh, while we have little ecological information, we have this nice illustration. Uh, we have this early photo from about 1870 or so. As you can see, we've got some firs on top of the spiltful. We have a nice full-grown, open-grown uh, oak or sycamore, which suggests the landscape's been used for uh, open pasture. But there's nothing to suggest in this particular photo uh, any heathland at the site. Uh, there's a whole series of modern survey maps that we can use in photographs, but roughly reconstructing the landscape um, around about 1884, uh, it's an open pastoral landscape uh, with a, a race course, uh, some woodland, and a small area of rough grazing shown on the OS map. How am I doing for time? You've got six minutes. Great. I'll speed up then. Skipping forward to 1945, the First World War and the Second World War increased the deforestation of the site, uh, and by about 1945, a combination of factors have led to the maximum extent of heathland uh, that we see there. After North 1945, uh, in the period immediately after the Second World War, uh, the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947 was passed. Shortly after this, it was realized that a body needed to be established to provide protection for sites of biological and later geological interest. This was the Nature Conservancy Council, who designated the site a, uh, a spe site, special scientific interest in 1954 for its heathland. When these reserves were being set up though, the dominant idea in ecology was that of a climatically controlled climax vegetation. Ideas such as those of disturbance ecology and the important role of humans in systems such as heathland would come later. Uh, and so when this was set up, it was imagined it would always be heathland. Uh, but of course what happened is the wild re-established itself because the managers just did not know how to manage the heathland. The idea of disturbance as a central part of heathland ecology was not known. In the UK, if you abandon a place or if you let it go and not manage it, it just grows trees. In about 40 years, you'll get a nice broadleaf forest. And that happens everywhere, more or less apart from the north of Scotland and coastal regions. So uh, by the early part of the 21st century, like a lot of triple SIs, it was in danger of being denotified because it no longer supported the ecological system it was there for. So that's the ecology part. 
They got a huge lottery grant and they chopped all the trees down. And so it's now natural. <laughs> <laughs> and here it is. So this is the Devil's Spitfall, just quickly. Um, as a place designated by the state in 1954 as a wild space, uh, people started to use it for a whole different set of activities. Uh, as you can see, it's a sandstone crag with a cliff uh, at the, on my right-hand side. And all along the top and all around it are outcrops of sandstone. When I started doing this, I expected to find some graffiti, but I didn't expect to find such old graffiti. Uh, there's a very dubious mark that might be 1611. There's quite a good mark from 1771. And the Stokes family had a picnic uh, in 2015, as we can see. Uh, and so the graffiti is kind of spread out over uh, blocks, mostly on the top, but also on the side. Most of the graffiti congregates at the top end of the hill uh, on these large blocks. So here's just an example. So you get these bosses. It's probably not a very good photo. Uh, but what you do get are you get these what I call graffiti crowds. Most of the graffiti is exposed along the top. People seem to prefer to inscribe on one of these top uh, blocks to create what we might call graffiti crowds. The dense crush of the symbols. Oh, sorry, where am I? The dense crush of the symbols and their humanity seem to negate the loneliness and isolation of the spot. They call to mind the crowd symbols of Elias Canetti, whose simplest symbol of the crowd is the cairn, each anonymous stone, the representative of a crowd left to indicate the larger presence. This crush very much reminds me of a cairn, but just a graffiti cairn. Uh, but not everyone wants to be a member of a crowd. And as you can see on the side panels, we have more isolated bits of graffiti. It's worth bearing in mind the stone's very soft, so any mark you make is liable to, to disappear and erode, uh, depending on where it is in quite a, a rapid space of time. Marks made as recently as the 1990s are almost gone, so they come and go quite quickly. And that photo didn't work. Uh, I had an ortho photo. So one of the other things we found, though, <clears throat> away from the main crowd of graffiti is this very unusual sculpture. Uh, any idea why that photo didn't work? Never mind. Sorry. Um, so we did, um, I got a technician and he came along and we took a, a series of uh, photos using a pole. Uh, the block itself is about uh, two meters by three meters. It's obviously took a lot of time to carve and work it's a very odd uh, miniature landscape, perhaps a townscape. Uh, there's stairways, there are what look like amphitheaters or ball courts, there are inverted pyramids. It's a really unusual thing. Um, all we know about it is that there's a guy called KP um, and somebody's written Ask Les, which is just in the little inset <laughs> on the side, but I haven't been able to find Les just yet. <laughs> Just quickly, elsewhere at the Spitalfall, we have, there was for about 15 years, a really nice uh, motocross track, which the Wildlife Trust really didn't like. Uh, people go and have parties, get drunk. They build shelters, they camp illegally. They, uh, if travelers are passing through, because Worcestershire is on a route up to the Appleby Horse Fair, they bring their horses on and tether them, which drives everybody into a state of panic, uh, and so on and so forth. I don't really have time to discuss that. So just to finish up, uh, some quotes from Walden. The Devil Spittleful appears from both its name and creation myth and remarkable aspect to have been an oddity within the landscape for a long period of time. Humans such as Thoreau argue that we need the wild as an escape from stifling routine. Forests and nature reserves appear to have provided a location for that outlet. From the 18th century onwards, possibly earlier, people have been visiting this place to negotiate a space for themselves and to make their mark as graffiti, either in groups or <laughs> privately. Ecologically, the trees and bushes and animals have an essential nature. They know what they are and what they want to do, and they form communities based on the interactions of their core natures. Perhaps this is their essential otherness. Human beings' thought and behavior exist within a relativistic pattern. We fluctuate between contentment and alienation, 
to create the world around us. But we know, and Thoreau knew, that the wild is there and will always be there waiting. Thank you.